but nobody really cares about how the flood story actually ends, which is that, you know, they land, and one of the first things Noah does is plant a vineyard, distill the grapes, get hammered drunk, and then he does what drunk people do, he strips naked and passes out. Welcome to Working Preacher Books Podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson, along with Band at the Podcat, as we gain insights and hear stories straight from Working Preacher Books authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. In this episode, Caroline will talk with me. And my brother, Carl Jacobson, we are the co-authors of a new book called Divine Laughter, Preaching and the Serious Business of Humor. My brother, Carl, is uh, Carl and I uh, have written uh, together many times. Carl is a pastor. He's also a Bible scholar, Old Testament scholar. And as I've also said, he's my brother. Well, welcome to you both. Rolf and Carl, glad you could join us on the Working Preacher Books podcast. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. It's good to, good to be with you. So, uh, Carl, uh, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit to the uh, listeners? Sure. Um, well, as you said, I'm a, a parish pastor. I, I have a degree in Old Testament as well. I've, I've taught for several years at Augsburg. Well, now university, used to be college, Um uh, and I'm back uh, in the parish. I serve a, a church called Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd in Minneapolis. I am married. Uh, my wife, Angela, and I share uh, five children, ages 15 to 24, live in St. Paul. Um, what can I tell you? I am um, graduate of uh, St. Olaf College and Luther Seminary, and uh, yeah, just excited to be with you all for this conversation. Well, we are very excited to have you here, Carl. And so we, it's a different little bit of a format this time. Usually it's Rolf and me asking questions. And now it's, I, I, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a great conversation with the three of us. And, uh, and maybe we'll get a bandit, uh, podcast sighting. We'll see. I hope so. Yeah. But here's what I want to start with actually is as I was reading this book, I mean, one of the things that you talk about is a kind of homiletical resistance to humor, especially like when we read the biblical texts and when we approach the biblical texts, it's, it's as I think you uh, wrote, it's the Holy Writ, you know, it's the Holy Bible. And so it can't possibly have any inflection or uh, meaning or vocal variety. You just have to read it super seriously. And I really think that has been a huge influence on how people read the Bible and even think about the Bible. So uh, one of the questions I just have off on the on the front end here is, how do you help our listeners think about that kind of transition or that kind of way of coming to the Bible, not so seriously. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, for me, it all goes back to something that uh, a teacher that the three of us all shared, um, Don Jewell used to do when he was teaching Mark in particular, um, he'd have us read the text out loud and ask us to bring inflection, especially to dialogue. Um, and so probably the most famous example, right, is the centurion who declares the divinity of Jesus. And Jewel's question was, well, is, is he confessing faith in that moment? Or maybe he's being sarcastic. So re read it in a sarcastic tone. Uh, and it, for me anyway, that really helped me begin to understand how, you know, the text has nuance. Uh, and if we can imagine what that nuance might be, it, it opens it opens it up in ways that are really important. Mm -hmm. we, one of the points we make in the book is that translators often, um, first of all, I'm not sure they're aware of when the Bible's being funny, but if they are, <laughs> um, they'll usually um, hide it. Um, and uh, so the story, or um, 
and especially you know uh, anything uh, approaching like um, sexual humor, like the story of Abraham and Sarah, is uh, at the, which leads to Isaac laughter. And uh, there's a lot of jokes in there about like sex in that story. Um, so translators often, uh, I think, uh, are protecting their pious readers from what the Bible actually says in its uh, Hebrew and Greek mm -hmm. uh, languages. We have just moved into a PG podcast, I think. <laughs> well, <laughs> Speaking of funny, we'll see, I can be funny too. Okay, here's my next question. But I find that really refreshing, you know, that it, it that we bring this sort of uh, not so serious approach and really be open to the humor. I think about the woman at the well when Jesus says, you know, I, unless you have this living water and she's like, you don't have a bucket and <laughs> this well is deep. Like, where do you think you're going to get this living water? And so that inflection, I think, is very freeing. And I found that really helpful in the book. Second question, what can preachers learn from stand-up comedians? I love that, that section of the book. Well, I'm going to set up Carl to answer the question, but um, I want to set it up by... We've, we've, we've written funny books elsewhere. Uh, our books, Crazy Talk, uh, a not-so-stuffy dictionary of theological terms, is intentionally trying to be funny, as is the sequel, Crazy Book, and my book about the Old Testament um, in the uh, Homebrew Christianity series. This is not a book that's trying to be funny. This is a book about what humor is. And Carl actually started to work this territory um, long before uh, he invited me into it. So, Carl. Yeah, well, for me, it started uh, really in, in, in two ways. First, it, in the ways that um, comedians would engage uh, religious material in general, but also scripture. Uh, and, you know, one of the most famous, of course, is you know, Sam Kinison's routine about Jesus. Um, and, you know, one of the bits he does is it, w way before there was language about Jesus having a, or, or people talking about Jesus having a wife, you know, Jesus, uh, according to Kinison, of course, Jesus wasn't married, right? Because who would believe any, you know, what wife would believe anything this guy has to say? <laughs> Where have you been for the last three days? Oh, oh, you've been dead. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so it's, it, Ken, listening to Kinison read part of that story and turn it on its head, again, was really eye-opening for me. And that then became kind of an avenue to think about, well, how can we look at the text differently? How can we, uh, especially with something that's really familiar to us, right? How can we be surprised by it? And so uh, one of the things I think preachers can learn from uh, comedians, and again, it's not about being funny. It's about the, the way that comedians approach the material, uh, we can look at a text that, that we think is familiar and try to find ways that we're surprised um, to, to let the text startle us. And, you know, as Rolf was saying, in some ways, the, um, the most obvious thing is to just let, let the text be what it is. When there's humor in it, don't try to gloss it over. Um, just one, if I may, one quick story. Uh, when I was in uh, confirmation, uh, it was my year. It was 90% boys. And um, our associate pastor uh, at St. John's in Northfield was struggling to keep our attention. Uh, it was just all he could do to keep us going. So he abandoned the curriculum and had us read from Judges the story of Eglon and Ehud. Right? So you've got this great big fat king. Um, who gets stabbed in the gut by the um, the Israelite hero, and Who's dirt spills out. Yeah, a southpaw. That's right, sinister. Right. So it's his, and dirt spills out. And then we spent as a confirmation class a bunch of time talking about why did he have dirt in his system until eventually, right, our associate pastor uh, explained, no, that's a euphemism for his insides, right, <laughs> and. Um, I remember thinking at the time, the Bible is just way cooler mm. 
than I could ever have imagined. Mm. Yeah. So the, the way that comedians view, whether it's specifically scripture or more generally, more broadly, the world around us, um, that's a, a lens that we can borrow uh, as preachers. Yeah. I also think um, we've learned from humor how to really tackle very, very difficult topics. Um, you know, I mean, I think a movie like Blazing Saddles gets at American racism um, far. It opens up the conversation about racism a lot easier, more easily than if uh, um, th than a, a drama in some ways. And that so humorists um, f all the way from um, well, like from Mel Brooks in in Blazing Saddles up through um, the comedians who are working today are able to get at really difficult topics. And so that that really caught our eye about I'm afraid to preach about this, but these stand up comedians are taking us right to the heart of the matter. Um, and the other the other thing is that they. They look at the world differently, and preachers ought to. Uh, uh, Carl's, uh, um, you know, preachers need to look at the world and see the Holy Spirit at work, and be able to locate the work of the Triune God. Uh, Carl, tell us the the Jerry Seinfeld bit about how humorists see the world. Oh, uh, which one? Uh, the the um, dry cleaner. Oh yeah, so it, Seinfeld's talking about. Um, I think it was with Jim Gaffigan. and anyway, they're, they're walking down the street in New York and, and Seinfeld, they, they go by a dry cleaners and he goes, you know, I was working on this bit where, you know, when you decide you're going to take your clothes to the dry cleaner, you can go to any dry cleaner in the city. But when it comes time to pick them up, right, you, you have to go to the one, you, you don't have a choice anymore. And, and he said, that's not a joke, but it is a way of looking at the world, mm. right? Um, and so I think he was trying to find the, the joke in it, but what I appreciated about it was, yeah, uh, it's it's the viewpoint that was central there. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think too that it's what you talked about, Rolf, uh, the way in which humor can and comedians can tell a kind of truth in a way about us and about our situation that that sort of disarms uh, disarms the audience. And so in part that it's not, as you were talking about, not about being funny, but these kind of techniques that we strive for as preachers, a kind of rhetorical, homiletical techniques that, that maybe we can then speak about or talk about different topics that we would maybe not be able to do so without, without that humor. Uh, here's another question. Why is it important, do you think, that God has a sense of humor or that Jesus laughs? What is it about that that you think is important for preachers to think about and for their congregations? So I'll put it this way. Here's a, um, here's a, uh, we quote uh, Peter Berger a lot in this book. Uh, because he's uh, he wrote the best book about humor that we found um, called Redeeming Laughter. And uh, he writes, humorlessness, here's a quote we don't have in the book. Humorless is a cognitive handicap. It shuts off the possibility of certain insights, perhaps prevents access to an, an entire sphere of reality. Um, so I think it's important um, to let God be funny when God is being funny because... Um, through through God's humor, God is opening up an entire sphere of reality for us. Um, that if we deny that in God, we are denying part of the creation. Mm. Yeah, and in terms of Jesus laughing, I, I would say that you know the incarnation isn't full and real if Jesus doesn't laugh. Mm -hmm. um, to to experience um, and to embody the the breadth of the human experience. I mean, I don't, I don't doubt for a minute that that Jesus and the disciples had things they laughed over together. I wish more of them had come into the text, but you know, as we point out, um, maybe, maybe there's a lot in the text where Jesus is being funny that because we approach, you know, scripture in a certain way, we, we fail to see. I mean, is, is there anything funny about 
you know, the the woman who loses one of her ten coins and then goes bananas trying to find it and then celebrates having found it. I mean, we don't tend to think of that as humorous, but there's something at work there. Mm-hmm. And 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 throws a party, but then the punchline is there's more joy in heaven. Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, that's just part of the good news is there is joy in heaven. Heaven is not, according to Jesus, a, a, a completely serious space like Mark Twain uh, made fun of in his famous thing about the, the colonel or whatever, the captain who, you know, goes to heaven, doesn't, and he's given a harp and set in a cloud and he, he's not really <laughs> into music, you know, that whole thing. <laughs> Well, I think that's an important point because both of those points, that that sense that joy and laughter and humor are a part of the human condition and that we, to what extent we don't recognize or don't experience the fullness of the incarnation without that characteristic or without that feature of God and Jesus and theology. And and sometimes you just have to kind of laugh at theological stuff too. I mean, where'd you get that? Where'd you, where'd you, where'd you, how'd you make up that? You know, what, what is that from? Uh, but I think, I think that that is, I think that's a really important point. And it also invites a kind of recognition that as well, I think what I really appreciated too is an affirmation that God enters into that aspect of our lives and God sees that and recognizes that about being human, that that our relationship with God, like you were talking about earlier, Rolf, is not just super serious and all about our sin and forgiveness and what worthless worms we are and all those kinds of things that, that, uh, uh, that, that God also enters into those joyful, happy, humorous, laugh, laughter kinds of places. And I, there's something really refreshing about that, I think. You know, the, 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 this, the characteristic biblical story about laughter is Sarah and Abraham laugh at God, but especially Sarah does. And then God turns their laughter into, excuse me, God turns their cynical laughter into joyful laughter when a child named laughter is born. I mean, and that really, I see the, I see the resurrection through that, mm-hmm. that God's, God's job is to raise the dead and bring Easter joy and laughter to the whole world. Um, yeah. And there's no way God does that with a straight face. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, the, right. The whole thing with Abraham and Sarah, I, I imagine God snickering the whole time. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Aren't they going to be surprised? Kind of a yeah. 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 Another question that that this book raises: What does a joyful homiletic look or sound like? What do you What do you mean by that? Well, I'm I'm just going to circle back to something Roth just said, which is you know the, the purpose the purpose of the gospel, and therefore we might say the purpose of our proclamation is to raise the dead. And so a joyful homiletic um, mm-hmm. is about entering into, and it's not just entering into joyful times. It's about stepping into those dark places in people's lives and proclaiming something unexpected. Um, this diagnosis that is a diagnosis of death is not the final word. There's a punchline coming, if you will. Um, a joyful homiletic brings it into, and, and not to dismiss, uh, you know, a dangerous diagnosis or real heartache. That's not the point. But it's to bring in this conversation partner um, that rejoices in the fact that what God is all about is raising the dead. And yes, right now, you are dead. Mm-hmm. And the good news is that God is coming for you and God mm-hmm. will raise you up. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's one key part of it, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, the joyful homiletic sounds a different note and one that is often unexpected. Mm-hmm. I think it's also, I think a joyful homiletic, and we make this point pretty strongly, is is humble. Mm-hmm. Um, that part of the, part of the ability to, to laugh is the ability to laugh at oneself. And the ability to laugh at um, 
the tragic all the tragic things um i don't know too many people who are absolutely full of themselves who are really funny i mean there's a there's a large degree of humor um and anybody who's spent time around deathbeds like pastors do um learn to uh learn to laugh in the midst of the sadness and part of the reasons we can laugh is that we do believe that god is going to be you know in the empty tomb um in the darkness bringing about light and new life um and carl i'm going to read one quote i think you probably wrote this so uh and <laughs> it, it kind of gets at this so it's a good line that's what i think you wrote it um the ability to laugh in the midst of life's pain is a subversive witness to hope. Um, that's maybe my fa favorite line in the book. I'll just, I'm going to tell a story uh, briefly, I hope, but um, there's this great um, member of the congregation I'm now serving. Um, his name is Don Johnson. And uh, Don, always, when I would say, great to see you, he always said, great to be seen, better than being viewed. Um, like at a funeral, right? So uh, the funny thing was, boy, it was, it was summertime. We were worshiping outside in our courtyard, and that morning I greeted him the way I always did, and he responded the way he always did. And a week and a half later, he was dead. Mm -hmm. um, he died of cancer. He knew he had it. And um, he just didn't tell anybody because he 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 didn't want that to be the, the focal point of anything, right? So he he battled his cancer privately, uh, and the last time he saw me said better than being viewed, and he knew full well that I would remember that and um, share kind of a laugh about it, right? It, it was his way of of speaking uh, hope and joy in the midst of this. Uh, darkness that he was facing. And um, uh, to me, that's just, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I love that. I love the idea of, of laughter and humor and joy being uh, almost like resistance, mm -hmm. <laughs> resistance speech or resistance way of being just, yeah, I love that. Well, that brings me, that brings, brings me back to Mel Brooks, um, who, who made a movie, right? You know, Brooks is Jewish, and the the point of his life was to make fun of evil. Um, and he even then uh, had springtime for Hitler, you know, the, uh, the, the play. And he said, listen, get up on a soapbox with Hitler and you're going to lose. He was a great order. But if you can make fun of him, if you can have people laugh at him, you win. Do you know what I mean? That is the... There's something really true that the um, that the the narcissists and the and the fascists and dictators hate being laughed at, and so I mean the deeply subversive nature even of a career like Mel Brooks. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I would I would add to that that there's there's something um, creative about it, and I mean that. Um, in, in both senses that, yeah, it's a creative act, but it's also an act of creation. I mean, we're partnering with God at that point in reshaping the world. When humor um, brings this subversive hope and challenges darkness, uh, it creates a new possibility. And so that's, that's joining with God in God's creative work in the world that is ongoing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I can't imagine anything better to be about well, one of the things we could we could talk all day about about your book, and I just I I'm just going to show it on the podcast here. Y'all need to pick up this book, and because I think one of the things that this book does, it leads into our next section of our our podcast conversation, which we always ask our guests is about their sources of inspiration, their hope in general, and how to get unstuck in the sermon writing process. And the first thing I thought about when I was thinking about this question is how 
divine laughter and humor can be a tool for unstuckness, getting unstuck in, in your homiletical engagement with the text. So it almost becomes like a, like a hermeneutic with the text, like, all right, where, where are the funny pieces here? How might that just kind of move me away from, you know, oh, I've got to, I, I, you know, what's the point of this text? What's the meaning of this text? What the focus of the text? What am I going to, what am I going to preach on? I just found immediately that this could be just a way to push you in a little bit different kind of direction that then the preacher doesn't take uh, take herself so seriously. What do you think about that? Do you think that that's that's true? And and how how what, what kind of techniques or what kind of tools preachers preachers lean on to get unstuck in their sermon writing process? I have this to say about getting unstuck, um, and this is going to qu quote Don Jewell again. Um, he said, "If a chorus isn't going well." quit working so hard. Mm. Just relax. Don't try to over plan. Just actually quit working so hard. And he, he meant it. And so I think one way to get stuck, to get unstuck is you got to disengage a little bit. And, um, I mean, it's a joke, right? Quit working so hard. Mm. Mm -hmm. I have one other thing about that, but Carl, what's a uh, thought for you about, when you're stuck. Well, just to, to circle back to the way that um, comedians view the world, I, I think adopting somebody else's lens can be really helpful. So if, if I'm dealing with a story, um, and this is probably especially true of stories that we think we know really well, because um, we've worked with them for years, uh, if you can just find a different angle on the story, um, and sometimes, you know, when, because of the way we need to read the Bible in, in part in worship, we read chunks of stories out of context. And so sometimes getting into the broader context will help you see sort of uh, what the different angle. And my favorite example of that is the Noah story, which all right, we, we all know the flood story. Um, but nobody really cares about how the flood story actually ends which is, uh, you know, they land, and one of the first things Noah does is plant a vineyard, distill the grapes, get hammered drunk, and then he does what drunk people do, he strips naked and passes out. Um, <laughs> the one righteous man, mind you. Well, so, so why is that part of the story included? Um, it's, it could have been glossed over like we do, right? Because everybody knows a drunken Noah doesn't go on a baby's mobile over their crib. <laughs> But there's something but the to the story. Thinking, why is the room spinning? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Try, trying to put one leg out the so, uh. Okay. <laughs> it's just, it, it, so that, that part of the story forces you to see it differently. Yeah. So when yeah. it comes to getting unstuck, I think that's the, the, the key thing um, that I've picked up anyway from comedians. Yeah, I well, I think I think that's great, and I, I and here's an like, do you think that also that uh, that humor can offer a kind of mm, maybe this is not the right term, but a kind of midrashic approach to scripture. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think about uh, going back to the woman at the well and, or no, the wedding at Cana. And I will often paraphrase Jesus response to his mother by saying, you know, he said, what, he says, woman, what is it to you and to me? And my paraphrase is that is mom. It's not my problem. They should have gotten a better wedding planner. And, and so I think those, <laughs> those kinds of things are sort of refreshing and they, <laughs> They just, you're just not taking the sex so seriously. So, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, um, a teacher of ours uh, preached at dear friend's wedding and he got into the pulpit and realized there was no Bible. And so he just told the wedding, the Cana, that was the text. So he told it from memory and it was a lot better. <laughs> when, then, and then one of the things he said, he says, Hans and Kristen, this is the kind of God you have, a God that once he starts to being gracious, doesn't know when to quit. I mean, 
he didn't give just a little champagne for a toast. He gave six huge vats of wine, enough to get the whole wedding party in serious trouble. I mean, kind of let the story be funny, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, great. Say so another another question that we like to ask our guests is if you have any books or resources that you turn to to fill yourself up spiritually, uh, besides watching stand-up comedians on a regular basis, I have a feeling the two of you do that a lot uh, to to fill yourself up spiritually. But are there any are there any authors or books or yeah other kinds of resources that that when you need that you need that well to be filled that you that you go to? I, I, this is not uh, first of all. Um, when I was a parish pastor, I made it a point of reading a, at least one book about preaching a year just to continue to grow in the craft. And of course, this year it ought to be this book, right? Um, but I mean, that you have to work at your craft. Um, the We have a group, uh, we dedicate this book to a group of um, friends of ours who are all pastors that we spend a week together each year. And that, I mean, to spiritually renewing is to spend time with other preachers. Um, and it's a time uh, in some ways where, we've, where we can go and just let off, let the steam out um, and pray and read and study together. Hmm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll confess, Carolina, I, um, my answer to your question is no. There, there isn't... Um, there isn't a, a particular set of resources. I mean, I, I do a couple of things every year. I, you know, I read uh, Luther's Freedom of a Christian almost yearly. I'll go back and look at some old kind of classic stuff. I love, um, I love C.S. Lewis's uh, Case for Christianity. I, I do those kinds of things. When it, when it comes to, I stopped reading books on homiletics a long time ago because it, it felt like the same sort of routine Mm. Um, which is why I started turning elsewhere outside of, of um, religious or theological uh, work to try to find some inspiration. Because as, as Rolf says, the, um, the goal ought to be to hone one's craft as a preacher mm -hmm. uh, as, as well as possible. Um, and so I went looking elsewhere. And so mo yeah, most of my... Um, I, I get filled by stuff that I actually probably wouldn't recommend, you know, it's silly. <laughs> and what I mean by that is um, silly science fiction series or those kinds of things. I, I find a step away and maybe that circles back again to, to Rolf's um, comment that he shared from Jewel. Um, yep. I, I don't want to work so hard to, you know, be digging through all the spiritual stuff all the time. I got to yep. have a, I got to have a break. Mm -hmm. I'd say, I mean, to get renewed spiritually music, um, also, you know, both to sing, uh, we have a men's group at our church, um, and, uh, the convener of the men's group, um, said, you know, if I had to pick between the sermon and the hymns, uh, I'm glad we have them both, but if I had to pick, <laughs> sorry, pastor. I pick the hymns, mm. you know, um, to listen to music, to sing, to uh, go on YouTube and watch John Prine videos for two hours. I mean, it it does something. Uh, it brings me spiritually to life. Mm. So uh, I'm just going to interject back to the whole subversive thing um, and hymns. When I was a, a college student, I studied abroad. I was in Shanghai uh, for a term. And uh, I went to the the big Lutheran church for Christmas Eve, um, and they were allowed to worship. Scripture was not to be read. There was no preaching, and the prayers were edited by, you know, some communist stooge. Uh, and so really, all the thing was, was a hymn sing. Mm -hmm. And I, I rode my bike back to the university laughing the whole way, right, because these foolish communists didn't realize all of the scripture that's written into these hymns, right? Yeah. I mean, it's so the, the songs 
those songs were terribly subversive, and it was just gorgeous that they didn't see it. Well, as you know, we also have another co-host on this podcast who is Bandit, the podcast, and Bandit also has a couple of questions for you as we get toward the end of our conversation. So Bandit would like to know from each of you, Rolf and Carl, what is one game you could play endlessly without getting bored? Yeah, it's Settlers of Catan. Exactly. <laughs> Settlers but of Catan. Settlers of Catan. But we just want to point out that it's the four person version and one of the uh, one of the four people has people has to be Mike Pancoast because the game hates him. <laughs> awesome. All right, Bandit has one other question and that is what food you could eat every single day. Does it is nutrition uh, a parameter? Absolutely not. No. Well, Cheetos. Cheetos. I mean, I, I don't eat them ever because they're so bad for me. But yeah. Like the crunchy ones or the puff ones? The crunchy ones, but it just none, none of this flaming hot stuff. Just <laughs> straight traditional. <laughs> what about you, Carl? Oh, I, I could probably eat... Um, Lo mein every day. Lo mein. Oh, yeah. Mm. Awesome. Again, I don't because <laughs> talk about a, yeah, yeah, hard on your system. But I get it. Yeah. I get it. Well, I think that at the end of this, at the end of this podcast, I think you should, I would encourage both of you to take your uh, stand up divine laughter preaching and the serious business of humor on the road and see what would happen with your your stand-up com comedy routine. <laughs> but thank you so much for a great conversation. Thank you for listening to this episode of Working Preacher Books Podcast. Stay up to date on our conversation at workingpreacher.org. You can follow us on Twitter or Facebook and find the latest in our Working Preacher Book series at workingpreacher.org slash books. Thanks for joining us.